Welcome to episode 493 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm actually Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing John Fitzgerald. He is the co-founder of the Slam Dance Film Festival and runs Filmmaking for Change, resources for filmmakers to make films that transform the world. And he's the founder of Cause Cinema and Cause Pictures, where he's produced a number of films. We talk through his career, film festivals, slam dance, and how to infuse your own films with real meaning that can potentially change the world without being preachy. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six-figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Our final deadline is July 31st. We're looking for low budget shorts and features. I'm defining low budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than 1 million US dollars. We've got lots of industry judges reading the scripts in the later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes. I had the winner from 2020, Richard Pierce, on the podcast in episode 378. Definitely check out that if you haven't already. He won the contest that year and was introduced to one of our industry judges, Ted Campbell, who took the script to Mar Vista Entertainment and got the film produced. So check out that podcast episode to hear the experience in Richard's own words. Again, that's episode 378. And we've had a number of options and some writers getting paid writing assignments as well. And this is only our fourth year. So getting a nice bit of traction with these scripts. We also do have a short film script category, 30 pages or less. So if you have a low budget short script, by all means, submit that as well. I do have a number of industry judge producers who are specifically interested in short scripts. If you want to submit to the contest or learn more about it, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. And again, this year we are running an in-person film festival in tandem with our screenplay contest. It is for low budget films produced for less than 1 million US dollars. We have a feature and shorts category for that as well. The festival is going to take place here in Los Angeles, California from October 6th to the 15th. If you produce a short film, Film or know someone who has or have a low budget feature film, by all means, please do submit it. You can go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival. And we are also on Film Freeway if you'd like to submit that there as well, both for the screenplay contest and for the film festival. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival or sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest, or just look up SYS's six figure film festival and screenplay contest on Film Freeway. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving me a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episodes episode number 493. If you want my free guide, how to sell a screenplay in five weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to selling your screenplay screenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing John Fitzgerald. Here is the interview. Welcome John to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Happy to be here. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in the South Bay here in Los Angeles. And, uh, Mother remarried, ended up in the Valley and uh, was always somewhat interested in what was happening with movies. Uh, I had a lot of friends. I should say my parents had friends in the business. So they were they were always giving me posters and telling me what was coming up for their studios. Uh, Fox and Universal specifically had them all over the place. Um, Never really thought of the film business as a place to work necessarily, but I went to college at UCSB and uh, took a little break one one semester uh, and during the summer and went through some some rather traumatic experiences to say the least and uh, was telling a therapist about it. And she said, that sounds like a great movie. Have you ever have you ever read Sid Field's screenplay book? 
And uh, I said, no, of course, why, why would I? <laughs> so, so of course I read the book, thought this is, this is a great little therapeutic exercise for the summer. And I wrote a screenplay, a uh, really bad one. Mm -hmm. But um, what was interesting for me about that, just to put this into some context for your listeners is that uh, I wasn't really thinking about film as a, as a vocation necessarily, but I went back to, to, to college as a junior uh, and, and took an introductory film course and realized, wow, this is amazing. This is a culmination of all the arts, mm -hmm. um, you know, writing, cinematography, design. I just, I just loved it. And yeah. um, so I took that course and declared my major in film studies. And that's kind of how it all started. I didn't know if I was going to direct or, you know, what role I was going to play, mm -hmm. but yeah. So after college, so you get done college and then what were some of your first forays into actually getting into the business professionally and making money? Yeah. So interestingly, I, I did the thing a lot of, a lot of emerging uh, film buffs do right. When you're trying to get a job is uh, I got a job at the training program at William Morris. Uh, at the time it was called triad, but they were absorbed by William Morris. So it was a, an amazing experience for me just to learn who's who, and you know you're reading scripts and reading contracts you're really learning everything you can and uh after doing that for i'm going to say six months to a year i felt like i got as much as i was going to get out of that i worked for an assistant i worked as an assistant for an agent um i i started working in production I, my first job was a pa on my cousin Vinny, huh. which was amazing mm -hmm. um fun to work on a movie that people know and uh most people enjoy. Mm -hmm. So uh, fun story there. And uh, I did another half a dozen or so. And every time I'd go and work on one of these projects, I'd sock away all the per diem and come home, claim unemployment and and start writing. Mm -hmm. And eventually I got to make my first, first film, which was loosely based on the script that I started, you know, before I declaring my major years ago, mm -hmm. um, it's called self portrait. It's about a, a young a young student who's trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life and wants to be an artist. So I made it more of a visual artist and a painter. Mm -hmm. um, and that film didn't get in to Sundance. So me and two other guys started Slam Dance. Mm -hmm. So I kind of fell into the festival director role. The two other guys left to do their own thing after the first year. And I became the executive director and, and ran that for the next three years. Um and then I was invited to to come and take over AFI Fest, so I became mm -hmm. the festival director at AFI. So let's talk Bigger. about let's talk about Slam Dance just a little sure. bit. Um, I, one of my first experiences in LA, I went to it was back then it was the Sunset Five right there on um, Sunset, and um, Dan, you would know him better than me, Dan, Dan Mer Mervish. Yeah, yeah, he was there with I think it was called Oak. Nebraska, the movie or Oklahoma, the movie or something. He had Omaha, he had, Omaha, the movie. Yeah. So he had, and he was out there pitching his movie and me and my buddies were just watching, you know, watching another movie. He was out there saying, Hey, we're doing a screening. So I sort of heard about it through that. He was a real hustler. And this was probably right about the time, 95, 96. So in any event, yeah. I sort of knew about slam dance. And then when I went to Sundance once I actually went and saw a screening, it was just a great um, it was a great experience, a lot of fun, um, just a great atmosphere. And I know for my own festival, I've always thought about that as trying to give that great experience. But just can you tell us a little bit about that? Just what did you do for these three years? What does that look like? How do films get into slam dance? I mean, as the filmmaker, you always hear that you need a sales rep and a producer's rep and a this and you need someone, you know, need someone on the inside. Slam dance obviously was sort of in in to 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 revolt against that sort of Sundance being on the inside things. But ultimately, slam Slam dance became popular too and had to turn away a bunch of filmmakers. And that was some offshoot. I mean, there's now there's a bunch of these sort of second tier Sundance festivals going on as Sundance. Um, but what can you talk about? Okay, what can you tell us about that? How do you get into a festival like Slam Dance and maybe even, you know, some of these other big festivals that you worked on, like Santa Barbara? Well, I, I think, you know, one of the first points you made was just why that festival was created and, and what it was really all about. And I think what's important is that it's still to this day, I mean, it's what, I don't know what it is, 30 years ago now? Yeah. Uh, it was 95 when it started. Um, filmmaker, you know, by filmmakers for filmmakers, the, the programmers there are, uh, Peter Baxter still oversees everything. He became a co-founder uh, when I left and took it over. Um, and 
I think it's great because ultimately you have you have festival alumni from slam dance voting on the films that come in mm. the following year and and so I do think that they try and stay true to their roots and and really help with emerging artists and discovery a lot of festivals kind of are struggling, frankly, for an identity that when we started Slam Dance, there were less than a thousand festivals. And now there's, you know, well over 5,000. Some some would say 6,000. Um, so I think what's important is that, you know, these festivals have to have a mission, right? Are they going to be, are they going to be a destination festival? Are they going to be a community festival? Are, are they going to have screenplay competitions? Are they going to be juried? You know, our second year of slam dance, we, you know, we, we, we decided to start a screenplay competition and that's still going today. So in terms of your, your writer listeners, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it can do wonders for your career. It, you can, you can, you know, be discovered by producers and studio executives by winning top screenwriting competition. So film festivals can do a lot of things. And I think, you know, in terms of how you get in, I have a, a course that I do with Justin Giddings, um, called film festival mastery which over 300 filmmakers are taking right now mm -hmm. uh it's it's amazing because as you said it's really hard to get into some of the top festivals and it sadly can become you know how do i get on the radar who do i know who can make a call i definitely don't think you need to have a producer's rep or an agent to get into a festival but th the sad truth is that there are a lot of you know film students and film buffs that are kind of brought in by these festivals who don't have much money to to essentially be that first line of defense, right? They're the screening committee, if you will. And so sometimes it can help to have somebody make a call on your behalf. And we even have a whole module in our in our course called Getting on the Radar. What is that angle to just have that film? Sundance had 14,000 plus submissions last year. And some of the smaller festivals have, you know, four or 5,000 submissions. So how are you going to how are you going to make sure you get get a shot, you know, mm -hmm. and it's getting on the radar? Do you have any tips for screenwriters, um, especially in the context of like a screenplay contest like Slamdance was running? Are there some particular tips that you would say for writers that are particular types of scripts, particular genres, um, just any tips for screenwriters who are entering these, these contests? Well, I, I think the first thing I would suggest is to do your homework. Uh, unfortunately, there are so many it's a kind way of saying this scams i guess for lack of a better word just just where 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 a film festival or an organization or or some entrepreneur decides i can charge a fee and call it a screenplay competition and give away some prizes and and, and earn entry fees but if those if those screenplay competitions aren't legitimate and aren't reputable then it's not going to do you any good anyway, right? Because most screenwriters, and in some cases, filmmakers, are are applying to these festivals or these competitions because they want to win some awards or they want to establish some credibility. And just like I tell filmmakers all the time, don't send your film to a bunch of film festivals that nobody's ever heard of, that probably doesn't have a hospitality program. Who knows if anybody's going to show up to your screenings Sometimes they're only virtual now. Make sure they're legitimate, right? Make sure it's worth your time. And if you if you want to leverage the the participation in these events as a calling card to to reach out to studio executives or producers or or other craftspeople in the film world, it helps to be be participating in festivals that have some credibility, right? Mm -hmm. So you get these these filmmakers that play in you know. 20, 30, 40 festivals, and you look at all the laurels and you haven't heard of any of these festivals because they're not really on the radar and they don't have a ton of credibility. So I think the first thing is do your homework and make sure, you know, there's a handful of, of screenplay competitions that that can really help you. And you it's not hard to find out who they are by just doing the search and reading the I know I know the Nichols Fellowship, Slam Dance, Austin, you know, there's a few others, but there's probably 20 or 30 other ones that can't really do you any good. So I think you, you want to make sure you're putting your eggs in the right basket.
Mm -hmm. So if, if a filmmaker gets accepted to a film festival, or um, I know like Austin has, if your script wins an award, they have a little banquet. So a lot of screenwriters go to that. Just Can you talk a little bit about if you're a screenwriter, you have a script, maybe you got an honorable mention at this festival. How can you go to that festival and make the most out of it? How can you get the most value? I mean, a lot of screeners got to travel by plane tickets, hotels. There is mm -hmm. kind of a real concrete cost to this. So what are just some, some quick tips for screenwriters that want to go to a festival and try and do some networking you have any anything for them well i, I think i, I think the, the a couple of things are the most important about participating in these events and 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 the first is to be active be proactive right there, there are so many filmmakers and screenwriters and other crafts people that, that go to film festivals and maybe they're going because there's a specific panel they want to see or a specific movie they want to see if they're a filmmaker that has a film in the festival, maybe they're they're kind of quiet and they and they don't necessarily want to go out and mix mix it up, so they just wait till they're screening. And I always tell filmmakers to participate, go to the happy hours, go to the receptions, meet as many people as you can because you never know who you're going to meet. I tell this story all the time. I was on a panel at a festival years ago, and I ended up talking about an upcoming project, and I ended up getting an investor, somebody from the audience. Hmm. right so it's just participating in these in these functions the panels the happy hours so i think it's important to participate that's the most important thing second most important thing is be prepared to talk about what you have right if it's if it's a short screenplay if it's a feature screenplay is it is it something that you're already done a schedule and a budget for and you're trying to raise funding for you're going to do it yourself is it something you're trying to set up at one of the studios I, I, I don't know, you know, depending mm -hmm. on, on your goals and, and where you land, it, it's just important to be able to talk about something. I've, I've made introductions to countless filmmakers over the years and they go in front of an agent and the agent says, I love your work. That's a great film. What's next? And they're like, uh, I don't know. I've got a few ideas, mm -hmm. but you can't really advance your career if you're not really ready to talk about the next thing that you're working on. So I think yeah. it's really important to have something. You don't, you don't have to walk into a party with a screenplay under your arm, but be prepared to talk about it, collect information, be prepared to send a deck or a script or a treatment. Be prepared to send something mm -hmm. so that you can take advantage of that introduction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's great advice for sure. So let's dig into some of your current projects. Um, to start out, let's just talk about Cause Cinema. Um, what is this project all about? So Cause Cinema was was created to initially be a recommendation engine. The whole idea around what I call social impact movies. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, some some years ago. Uh, I kind of put a pin in my festival directing career and decided to move back into filmmaking. And I, I made a documentary called The Back Nine, which led to a few other documentaries. I ended up making half a dozen documentaries. Most of them with some social relevancy. So I ended up writing a book called Filmmaking for Change. Uh, which I, I assume we'll talk about at some point today. Yeah, yeah, but for but sure. the point is, is the idea of cause cinema is that I see this almost as a as a as a subgenre, right? It's 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 a it's a exploding genre in terms of just people wanting to see something that has something to say. Mm -hmm. Seeing films, seeing series, docu series, you know, it doesn't have to be an inconvenient truth or or the cove. It can be something else, you know, about a person and what happened in their lives. And I just think that people, the time is precious. And I think people, if they're going to sit down on the front of the TV and watch something, they want to see something a lot of times. Mm -hmm. They want to see something that has some value or social relevancy. So Cause Cinema is, is first and foremost, a recommendation engine. It's going to help people figure out what to mm -hmm. watch and where to find it and talk about different themes we did. We celebrated uh, education month last month. I'm going to do a, a memorial showcase today, talk about 25 films that uh, are, are a great celebration of, of Memorial Day. So the idea is to help people find quality content and where you can where you can see them. So that's that's what Cause Cinema is mm -hmm. now. It eventually will likely become a fast channel of its own. Instead of sending you somewhere else, we'll actually oh, host I got it. You. 
Gotcha. Now I'm curious, just sort of philosophically, why are you so into these social impact movies? Um, you know, I think I turned on extraction too on Netflix the other day and, and, you know, there's definitely a market for that sort of stuff as well. Um, it's fun. You can relax. It's just sort of a fun moment, but maybe you can talk to that a little bit. Why socially important films? Why do movies that have a social impact? I think there's two different primary buckets, if you will. I think one is, is it a film that has a specific call to action, which I like? I, I like to believe that that film and media is probably the most powerful form of communication we have, right? It's super impactful. You see something, it inspires you, it engages you. And I think that we have an obligation as a as a as an industry to leverage this power of film to actually move the needle, right? Mm -hmm. You take movies like Food Inc. It, that movie really changed the diet for millions of people ac across the country that didn't know anything about it, right? You could take it to this, the same level with forks over knives. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of, just to stay in the in the food category, there's a lot that's been done there. And there's a lot on the environmental side. Uh, Racing Extinction did amazing things, uh, An Inconvenient Truth. So I think having these movies share something about what's going on in the world or what's going on with our health or what have you, I think th that it can, it can improve lives and it can improve what's going on on the planet. And I think if you do it right, we call it education for change and entertainment for good, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you can do these things without it being, you know, beating people over the head with, mm -hmm. with education. You can do them in an, in an entertaining way. You look at a movie like the Cove. I mean, that was, a movie that that felt like a thriller but it was a documentary you know mm -hmm. about the slaughter of, of dolphins in japan so you could take movies and, and and that was one of the driving forces behind filmmaking for change was the book was the idea that you can take the idea of something and create more of a narrative structure around the movie and and make it engaging and entertaining with the beginning and middle and end instead mm -hmm. of it being talking heads and, and just boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I first um, came in contact with you through your sub stack, um, your cause cinema sub stack. And maybe you can just explain that. I know there's a lot of writers on this podcast. Obviously, I've heard of sub stack. I see you, Matt Taibbi, a lot of these big journalists are getting into sub stack, but I don't really understand it. Why are you on sub stack? How does it work? Is this an opportunity for other writers to create their own little universe? Um, how is it monetized? Just give us sort of a rundown on sub stack. How do you use it why do you use it and could it be something sure. for writers to make money well I, well i think it's fun it's funny you ask because i was writing for years on on a a platform called medium i don't know how many of your writers understand medium but it was essentially a blogging platform hmm. but with medium you had to you had to be discovered in their search engine and and you had to you had to have people follow you and find you to read the pieces and and it just the 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 formula and the algorithms, I just I just never thought that it worked. It works for some people. Mm -hmm. Some people earn a good living there, but it's a tiny percentage. And one of the things I didn't like about Medium was that you didn't control your audiences. You didn't control your fans. You didn't control the people that read your work. With Substack, it is essentially a writing or a blogging podcast platform where you're creating content and it's going out to your people, your fans. But you control everything. So my last company, I had thousands of followers. Cause Cinema had thousands of followers. People looking for these recommendations. I would do a podcast every Friday telling people what to watch, saving them time. That mm -hmm. was my goal. So by 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 kind of transferring all of this over to Substack, I was able to take all those emails, export them, or I guess you should say import them into my new sub stack for cause cinema. Now, when I write something, it's emailed to all those people. You don't have to go to medium to find it. And if somebody wants to follow me or subscribe, that's now an email that I get, right? That's an email of a potential client, reader, fan, whatever you want to call them. And so I like that you have a sense of control and and if you create something, you know who you're sending it to. And if those people don't want your information, they can unsubscribe, mm -hmm. right? And there's most of the most of the platform is is anchored on free, 
right? So most people are writing for free, but you can have paid levels. So for example, there's certain there's certain elements of cause cinema where I'm just doing a podcast, recommending films and series. There's there's others where I'm doing a deeper dive into what's happening in the industry, or I'm doing a deeper dive into filmmaking for change, and I'm breaking down case studies. I'm spending a lot of time there. So for those, you have to be paid subscriber. So you can you can have like for five dollars a month or fifty dollars a year, you can subscribe and you get access to a lot more information. Gotcha. So it's up to you, right? Mm -hmm. How you play it. But I like that you have a sense of control. And there are business models. Look at the Ankler. You know, it's basically created by two two journalists. They're they're making money hand over fist because they've got a following. They got people that like their writing, and they're paying to subscribe. They're thousands of paid subscribers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. That's that's perfect. I, and I think it does give us a nice overview. As I said, I just I've never really dealt with it other than just reading some people's sub stacks. Um, so let's talk about filmmaking for change. Um, it's a book, a website, an online course. Maybe you can kind of tell us about that. What is um, filmmaking for change all about? Yeah, it's funny. I, I knew you were going to bring it up. So I, ha I have a copy yeah, here. Sorry, I just show you Well, it's funny. A uh, quick, quick two minute story on filmmaking for change. So I'm on a panel at a film festival in New Mexico. And on that panel with me is Michael Weesey, the MWP that a lot of your writers have probably seen. They did Save the Cat. Uh, and I said to Michael, why don't you have a book on social impact filmmaking? And he says, well, nobody's pitched it. I said, well, I, I could help you with that maybe. Tell me how it works. So anyway, long story short, walking back to the hotel and I got the whole rundown on how you, you, know, how you get a book published to them. Huh. So I wrote, I wrote an outline I wrote the first chapter and it was basically development, production, distribution. And I broke down with case studies because at that time I'd already made two or three documentaries. So I had plenty of my own case studies. And then I went to other people from the industry, entertainment lawyers, other filmmakers, distributors. I got words of wisdom from all of them. I put exercises at the back of each chapter and I just thought this is a great opportunity to help writers that are trying to write something, again, with, with some social impact at their core. And it doesn't have to be uh, a lot of them were documentaries, but there was also a whole narrative structure. But the other thing that was really important to me, and again, two other great books from MWP, Myth and the Movies and The Writer's Journey, both of these books really focused on Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. The 12 stages of the journey. I became a huge believer in that. I watched a few videos about George Lucas and how he used that philosophy for mm -hmm. Star Wars. So it's like, it's not just, you know, the social impact stuff. It's, 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 it's big movies. It's medium sized movies. So I wanted people to be able to find ideas and convert them into entertaining movies for change. So that's the, that's where filmmaking for change came from. Gotcha. And it's also, you've turned it into this online course as well, which is on the website. A few years ago, um, I feel like it was right around COVID. Um, there started to be kind of a, an emerging opportunity to create courses online. And obviously Masterclass has done wonders with that. And so somebody convinced me that I should create a course around filmmaking for change. I taught a course at a, at a local high school and uh, I just felt like it made sense. So I, I so filmmakingforchange.com was kind of converted into this course where you could you could take the course, you could you could get the book. Um, and then a few years ago, I I think it was 2017, uh, I did a second edition to filmmaking for change, which added a section for activation and how to take these impact movies and actually put them into action more than just you know getting them on a screen somewhere. Mm -hmm. So so I, I tried to expand the universe a bit around filmmaking for change and, and do that course. And then I also have a distribution course, Distribution Revolution, as I said before, Film Festival Mastery. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of opportunities to, to learn from engaging videos and conversations and resources. It's a lot more than just picking up a book, mm -hmm. right? If you take one of these online courses, you've got video modules. It could be three minutes, could be 40 minutes. So you've got these four modules that that break down all these categories with examples and slideshows and 
and, and lists. It's just mm-hmm. it's super comprehensive. Yeah. And um, so let's dig in a little bit to the um, story part of, of this. Um, you break it down, idea, structure, audience. You also do, you've mentioned the hero's journey. Um, Sid Field obviously was that sort of original three-act structure template. Um, what is your approach to structure? Maybe you can give us some tips. Um, I think Blake Snyder is a little bit newer, but very similar to Sid Field in terms of these sort of guideposts in your, in your screenwriting. But just talk about that a little bit. What is your approach to screenwriting structure? How do you teach it in your course? Well, I'm a big fan, again, of, of the hero's journey. So I, I think that if you took the three-act structure you know, the, the act one, act two, act three, act one, you know, the, I think Sid Field called them plot points, you know, and I think with, with the hero's journey, it's, it's, uh, it's crossing the threshold. So there, there are mm-hmm. these different opportunities and I'm a big fan of, of yes, things change when you start shooting, especially with documentary, but I'm a big fan of whiteboarding the exercises, right? So, so if you, if you know, there are certain things that you want to happen in your movie, and you whiteboard them out. Does, does it fit into Act One? Is it Act Two? Is it Act Three? Are you telling it in a, in a nonlinear fashion? But I think if you if you think about you know what your goals are, the call to the call to adventure, right? The first the first mm-hmm. big call that you get that becomes the goal, and then you're meeting. You know, I think they call it meeting with the mentor, meeting with the allies. Um, so you know you, you have to leave this ordinary world, right, to move into another world. Uh, metaphorically sometimes right to where you learn new things that are going to impact you as a character or your other characters and so I think laying all those pieces out on a whiteboard can be extremely helpful because you can see the arcs of your characters you can see the arcs of the story you can see the plot points and to be honest if there are 12 stages of the journey that fit into three acts it just gives you gives you guideposts to help you structure, you know, whether, mm-hmm. whether using three by five cards or four by six cards or a whiteboard. I mean, you're ultimately, I'm not a fan of just having an idea and starting to write. I think it helps to, to structure it out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, how is your changing thinking over the years? Um, obviously it sounds like you started your career in the nineties. Um, how are things changed? Um, what are some of the differences you see today with screenwriting, um, versus 20, 30 years ago? You know, there's more opportunity now than ever before. Um, I think that it's a bit, again, of a double-edged sword. I mean, you look at the, I mean, here we are in the middle of a writer's strike. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a certain percentage of writers that are su- considered successful, right? Earning a really good living. And then there's another percentage of writers that are working or were working before the strike that then uh, are still saying that they're struggling to earn a good wage, right? Based on the hours that they're putting in. So I think institutionally, it's still a challenge to be a writer because there's only a small percentage that are really thriving. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's more, more opportunity than ever before. If you have some entrepreneurial spirit or you bring on a producer that has the entrepreneurial spirit and you just stick to the creative, I do think there are more opportunities now to get movies made and to get movies seen than ever before. Right. Because we've got more tools than ever. You can write an entire movie that takes place in front of a green screen or you can write entire movies that take place in one or two or three locations. And and you can buy the equipment. I think I do an exercise in filmmaking for change where I say, look, for five thousand dollars. You can buy everything you could possibly need to, to make to make a movie. You can buy the camera, you can buy the, you know, the final draft, you mm-hmm. can buy a final cut, you can you can um you know, buy some gear and um, buy the software. You can do what you need to do for very little money. And you can get actors, great actors, some of them SAG, some of them non-SAG. I mean, depending on whether you're doing a SAG film or not, there's millions of actors that are just trying to break out, right? So mm-hmm. you can, anybody can just do a casting call. There are handful of casting apps out there now you don't have to go and spend a bunch of money and be on the breakdown service Mm -hmm. you can get actors and you can get tons of film students there's more film schools than ever before you can get film students that'll work for the experience so i think if you if you have the 
the, the you know the 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 drive to actually you know just make it happen or or hire somebody again to help you with some of the business stuff i think you can pull an all-star team together and and make it happen yourself which you couldn't have done as easily mm-hmm. 20 or 30 years ago and i'll say this too i focused a lot just now on how to get the movie made distribution i mean the gates are open wide right there's over 2000 streaming channels now forget about netflix and hbo and hulu and mm-hmm. amazon i mean yes there's the big boys but even if you don't end up on one of those channels there are hundreds if not thousands of other ones and and there are niche programming right there's there's sci-fi there's gay and lesbian there's cause there's there's a whole bunch of different mm-hmm. niches and there's fans in each of those categories so i think as long as you can find a creative way to tell the story and you get good at actors i would say one of the things i learned the hard way is don't skimp on the actors and hire all your friends get good actors because one of the hardest things as a festival programmer i can say wearing that hat mm-hmm. is you get thousands of movies submitted to you and more than half of them have horrible performances and that's the first thing screenplay sure got to have a good screenplay i'm going to assume that your writers are you know doing a can to some of them yeah <laughs> you know to, to to work on that craft but you know get mm-hmm. writing is rewriting get feedback make sure it's working make sure your goals you know you're too close to it get readers to give you feedback do surveys do mm-hmm. what you need to do but once you get to to the point where you're actually going to get the movie made hire some actors that will work for next to nothing just to have a chance to get some footage you know mm-hmm. build up their reels don't hire friends and family that are going to make your movie suck. Yeah. Yeah. So sound advice. So if, if a filmmaker or even a screenwriter, if they have one of these projects, that's a cause, you know, some sort of social impact type of a cause. um, Do you have any recommendations for how they can reach out and contact some of the, you know, the, the not-for-profits or even just the companies that are in that space. And I, I asked this in sort of the context, I've done a couple of Kickstarters. And one of the things I always notice is you see a lot of those types of movies go through Kickstarters where they try and tap into this sort of social cause um, that may be already in sort of the cultural zygust and, you know, but how do you contact that person on Twitter? That's a thought leader in this space. How do you contact that not for profit and say, Hey, do you want to help? What, what, what can you expect as a response? What is the appropriate, you know, way to contact them and to get them involved? And what can you expect from these, these types of organizations? Well, I, I said, there's a few, there's a few places to go um, where there's endless resources. Uh, one is Doc Society. Uh, they have a ton of case studies and a ton of resources. And what spell that out? Docs? You're saying D-O-X? Doc, D-O, I think it's D-O-C, DocSociety.org. Okay. 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 I believe it's based, I'm going to say UK. Um, Doc Society is amazing. Another one is SIE Society, which stands for Social Impact Entertainment Society. Uh, Robert and his his group there, I mean, they've pulled together a terrific stable of resources from fundraising resources to cast and crew to partnership opportunities. Uh, yeah, it's that's a that's a great organization to check out. And then I would just say, you know, I'm I'm one of those people that's very accessible. Um, I have few companies. I'm a very busy person, but I'm also constantly talking to emerging writers and and and, and filmmakers. So mm-hmm. reach out to, you know, John at causepictures.com and okay. I'll, I'll respond. And I, I have a few filmmaker clients that had screenplays and treatments, but they weren't really sure where to turn. So I sat with them. I said, look, tell me your five ideas. And I said, okay, these two are probably the ones that are going to give you the best chance of getting made. And, and then in one case, you know, she's over here, we're working on a whiteboard exercise. So she, you know, was to the point where she's ready to start writing and then we helped structure it. So mm-hmm. I think you want to, a lot of, a lot of screenwriters have many ideas, right? And the, and the trick is to find those ideas. I'm not a big fan of writing for what is more commercial. Like you read an article in the LA times about some script that just option to, you know, Bruckheimer or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't think you should write what's trendy. You should write what you know, but you may 
know or be interested in a handful of ideas. It, it can help to have somebody in the industry that understands what kind of companies might be interested in those ideas, what else might be in development, you know, mm-hmm. at a certain company or studio. Um, so I, I just think getting getting support is helpful. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so I always like to wrap up the interviews just by asking the guest um, if there's anything they've seen recently they thought was great. Obviously, you're doing recommendations, so maybe you can tell us some of your recommendations um, from Cause Cinema over the last couple of weeks, just um, something you think screenwriters can get some value from. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I notice is is writing um, because that's where it all starts. And I mean, it's it's pretty high profile, so it's not going to be a surprise to anybody. But I do think the writing on Succession is brilliant. Okay. And, and what's funny is I'm having so many people, I think someone on the last podcast recommended that too. I haven't checked it out, so it's definitely going to go on my go on my queue. Yeah, it's 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 really strong. I mean, it's 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 brutal at times. I mean, these are these are some messed up people, mm-hmm. but uh the writing is is so good. And then um it's a little lighter, but Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I mm-hmm. think the writing's great on that. Uh, Fleabag, I think, is a few years old now, but I remember mm-hmm. thinking that was that was brilliant writing. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of movie movies lately, although I did I did see Air, which I thought was pretty well done. Hmm. Okay, I would imagine that will be around come award season. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So those are all great recommendations. Yeah, thank you for those. Um, so what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, you can mention your websites here, but Twitter, Facebook, anything you're comfortable sharing, um, we will round up for the show notes. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'll I'll send you some links on the on the on the socials. I'm not really good at the social media thing, I'll say no that. Worries. But uh I do I do think that it's helpful for people to go to Substack and search cause cinema. Um, because I think that's really where most of my business is going to be focused. Mm-hmm. Um, I would also say that if you go to causecinema.com, there's a sign up there that, that brings you right into the Substack world. Uh, and if, and if, if you have, you know, ideas or projects and you're looking for some feedback or support, I mean, causepictures.com, you know, there's a contact information there. Okay, so perfect. any of those ways is, 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 is a way. Another idea that I was thinking earlier and I got off on some tangent and forgot about that I think is, is helpful for, for, for writers that are trying to reach somebody. Of course you can use IMDB pro cause you can get to almost anybody there, but getting to anybody there usually means getting to their agent or their lawyer or their manager. Mm-hmm. You can go to LinkedIn a lot of times. I mean, you're not going to get, you know, Matt Damon on the phone, but, but you can, you can get to people at production companies that are making the kinds of projects you're interested in or uh, studios or networks, Mm -hmm. but look at the production companies that are listed. Look at the names that are listed on the projects that are interesting to you as a writer and track them down via LinkedIn. You'd be surprised. Hmm. A lot of those people, you send a nice note, say, love to connect, love your work. And you know, I, I would say seven out of 10 times they're going to, they're going to connect with you. And then you, huh. once you're connected, you get the, the email and the yeah. contact. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's perfect. That's a great tip. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I've always used IMDB pro a lot, but I've never done much with LinkedIn. So yeah, again, thank you for that. Well, John, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and talking with me. Um, good luck with your projects and um, hope to have you back on soon. That sounds great. It's great to be here and uh, keep up all the great work you're doing to support writers. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time 
time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is a monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer, director, and actor Deborah Twiss. She just did an indie thriller feature called Sapiosexual. We talked through that film as well as some of her early projects and how she's been able to get these films funded and ultimately produced. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.